All right, so today I want to give you an update on my reticulated pythons. I actually have two really big retics. My biggest one, her name is Lucy. And believe it or not, the last time I weighed Lucy, she came in at about 90 pounds. She's a really big thing. As a matter of fact, she's probably close to 100 pounds now. She's eaten quite a bit since the last time I weighed her. And kind of the interesting thing with these big snakes is you definitely need two people to handle something that big. Lucy is about 17 feet long, which is kind of crazy. And you know, you, you can think you can handle 100 pounds <laughs> lifting it by yourself until you get 100 pounds that is squirming that's 17 feet long and let me tell you it is so difficult trying to handle something like that that has so much power and is just so long and lanky you definitely need two people just to get a handle on that snake it's kind of crazy and I'm actually breeding Lucy with Sonny Sonny is my other retake and he is believe it or not he's actually part dwarf and part super dwarf and he he's coming in at about 45 pounds not quite as big as as Lucy. As a matter of fact, I was trying to pair them up just a few weeks ago and they're still paired up and it doesn't look like they're actually going to breed, which is kind of a bar. It's kind of weird because I first put them together and they have all the signs. They have the tail wagging and they look like they're going to breed, but I didn't actually see a lock, which doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't breed, but as far as I know, I haven't really seen a good lock. As a matter of fact, last year I saw them lock up and kind of get stuck in copulation and they didn't lay eggs this year, which was kind of a bummer. I'm not sure, you know, how easy it is to actually breed some of these retics. A lot of people say, you know, they only breed them every few years. And then a lot of times, a lot of people say they won't breed until they're five years old, which is another challenge. A little bit different than ball pythons. You know, you can easily handle something like Bobby here around my neck, my bamboo ball python. And then when you compare this snake to a really big snake like that, it is a completely different level handling one of these monster snakes. So I'm going to jump over and kind of show you these snakes before I separate them and put them up into their separate enclosures. All right, so here is Lucy. Look at how big this girl is. And I keep them in this enclosure under lock and key. I use a, a little, it's, it's kind of a lock that they, they put on these enclosures that locks the front sliding glass, which I'm glad it actually has a lock so they don't get out. You definitely don't want a big girl like this actually getting out and roaming around the house. And look at how beautiful she is, really awesome. This is actually, a, it's actually a white albino, 50% jam pay a dwarf. And Sonny is a purple albino. Sonny is back here in the corner. Take a look at Sonny over here. He's kind of way back in the corner, way over there. That is Sonny. And it's, it's kind of interesting, the whole purple albino and the white albino, if you cross them together, you actually get a lavender albino, which is kind of half between the purple and the white. It's kind of an interesting gene that is like attached to the albino, the purple and the lavender, kind of crazy. So you have one copy of the gene, you actually get a lavender, two copies, you get a purple. And it's, you know, the the, the albino is also a recessive. You actually can't get the purple without the albino, which is kind of weird. So you, it's actually, you can't separate it and have like purple away from albino. It's, it's kind of linked to the gene, which is kind of an interesting effect. And look at the pattern on this one. As a matter of fact, I actually got this one when she was like the size of big around of, of like a Sharpie marker, really super skinny. And I did not think she was gonna get this big. She is such an amazing, such a big, snake and she's really kept a lot of her color and her contrast since she was a hatchling and kind of the interesting thing about this is if you watch some of my videos I actually kind of switched to uh, I've been switching a whole bunch of substrates so I keep going back and forth I, I started with the coconut husk and that's what I'm using right now the coconut husk and then I switched to a towel and then I found out that retics can kind of have problems you know, with the towel and the feeding and everything. So I switched to like a towel, hot glue to a piece of cardboard. And that worked pretty good, except I was chasing the, you know, they kept messing up the cage like every three or four days. And I finally just kind of dumped that. And then I went back to the coconut husk. And the problem with the coconut husk is a lot of times it'll it'll have too much humidity in it and it'll kind of put, it kind of get hot and steamy in here. And for some reason, this retic does not like it when it's hot and steamy. So what I actually did, take a look at this. I actually have uh, some kind of, of an air filter that I got over on eBay. I was actually on Amazon. So this is a, it's kind of like a Holmes air filter. And I put it right on the back and put this, this like, like the suction part right here, up against one of the vents in the back. And I turn it on a low setting. And it seems like this air cleaner kind of sucks the, 
the humidity out of here so it's not so hot and humid and steamy and then she has uh, kind of like a radiant heat panel up on the top that's set at 78 degrees I think I have it set and then she has a little panel a little hot spot right underneath there where it's like set to 88 but it's, it's kind of tricky with these retics if you don't get the humidity and the temperature just right then a lot of times they'll push and push on the enclosure and I put this little air cleaner and the coconut hops back in there and you can definitely tell she is happy happy as can be just kind of hanging out and not really moving much once they start pushing then you know you have a problem usually with temperature or humidity or you know if they went to the bathroom in there or something like that but this girl I don't know if she's kind of what, what she's kind of doing it looks like she's like sleeping or something I'm gonna try to see if I can touch her usually she'll try to buck me if I try to kind of mess with her and she's kind of in a bad mood, we'll see what kind of a mood she's in. Let's see if I can wake her up a little bit. She's like, leave me alone, don't touch me. I don't know what she's doing. I kind of want to get her to move around a little bit. Take a look at how big she is. Look at how big her head is. That is pretty amazing. She is a really super big snake. Really beautiful too. And it's, it's kind of interesting with these you really have to have a lot of respect for the big snakes because let me tell you If she comes flying out for a rat she has a tremendous reach and an incredible amount of power And a lot of people say hey it looks like you're scared of Uretic No I'm not scared I'm just very cautious As a matter of fact I really don't have any fear on these big snakes because I, I pretty much grew them up since they were hatchlings And you get to the point where you're so attached to them and you're so used to them you can easily put your guard down And some people can get really messed up if, if a big snake like this grabs onto you and thinks you're like food or something like that so you, re you really have to know you have to read them really well and figure out what mood they're in and I'd say Lucy right now she's kind of in a, <laughs> she's kind of in a sleeping mood she's not really in any kind of a mood right now except just kind of chilling out she's like hey why did you wake me up what's going on and I was wondering if she's going into a shed sometimes these these albinos can start going into a shed and and their eyes don't gray up and they really don't turn color that much and they'll just randomly shed and you have to kind of stay on top of that but she's a really super awesome snake so here is Sunny over here, kind of in the dark on this side of the tank. And it's kind of interesting on these, these sliding glasses, you really can't slide the glass open when they're right next to the side of the enclosure. So I'm almost like stuck right now, I can't open this, I can't open this enclosure on this side. And in order to actually open the enclosure over here, I have to get past this girl. So it's, it's kind of, you know, a dilemma. I kind of wish there was some kind of a, like a distance between this little lip down here and the glass so they wouldn't get right up against the glass to where I couldn't really really move the glass but you know I could definitely get in there if I, if I really had to but just to kind of open it up so I can show you is a little difficult but you definitely see on this one she has more th this is the male and he's got more of a purplish background as far as the background color of the snake makes for a really interesting combination and one thing, thing I like about these retakes is they usually have a really high contrast between all the different colors and they have some really scrambled up colors they are pretty awesome all right, so there you have it. Those are my reticulated pythons. And let me tell you, when I got those snakes as hatchlings, I had no idea that they were gonna get that big. <laughs> that is pretty big. As a matter of fact, I was kind of thinking that Sunny would get that big, maybe 40 pounds. I did not think that Lucy was gonna get up to 100 pounds. And let me tell you, I think she might grow a little bit more and put on some more weight. You know, reticulated pythons, they pretty much grow their entire life, and she's only five years old. So she could pack on a little more weight. I don't really expect her to grow a whole lot more, which is, which which is kind of nice because you know full mainland reticulated pythons I've actually seen them grow up to over 300 pounds which is way too much snake for and maybe even two people to handle that's kind of crazy so I kind of want to leave you an update on my ducks and my birds my chickens out in the barnyard area I have a whole bunch I actually finally got them all out into the barnyard I hatched all my own eggs from I actually bought hatching eggs on eBay and hatched them out it's it's kind of amazing how many birds I actually hatched out it's kind of like a bird sanctuary out there so that is pretty much it thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video so I wanted to give you a quick update on all my ducks and birds and everything here at the farm look at these guys these guys are super friendly these are Cayuga ducks and Cayuga ducks are a threatened species. As a matter of fact, there's only about a thousand female Cayugas in captivity, 
which is pretty amazing. I have, uh, hopefully I have about 10 females. I actually have 13 of them. And if I actually end up with 10 females, that would be like 1% of the entire population of Cayugas in captivity, which is pretty awesome. So I kind of give you a quick tour of all my ducks here. I have all these black Cayugas. And then I actually, I actually just pulled a whole bunch of birds out of the brooder and I'm putting here for the first time. I put them in here in the daytime to kind of get used to each other and eventually I'll let them all kind of run around this half acre. I like I have a half acre lot over here. But right now I kind of have them penned up in this little area. And I have three little Pekin ducks. Look at how cute these guys are. <laughs> Super cute little Pekin ducks. And then I just pulled my black Australorps out. I have 18 of these black Australorp chickens that are getting to the point where I can actually put them out here. I, I, you know, I, I kind of was on the fence whether to, to actually put them out here or not. And they're absolutely loving it, running all over the place. And then I have these four Muscovies. Muscovies are known for raising their own eggs and hatching them out. They're like the number one bird for hatching eggs. And they just kind of hang out together in a pile. They don't really go crazy over the water like the regular ducks. But this is a pretty cool little setup here that I have. I kind of show you this. <laughs> Chickens running around the corner. And they, they, they actually have this little enclosed spot here with the heat lamps and the feeders and the water. As a matter of fact, I actually set up uh, some fencing in here and separate them into the individual groups of birds at night so they don't fight at night. And during the day, they can kind of get away from each other. And then they have this little, I kind of set this up to where you can run around this little, <laughs> this little bear proof chicken coop over here. And the chickens seem like they like to hang out over on this side more than just kind of hanging out over here with the ducks. It's like, the, this is like mainly the duck area over here and then the area in the back. And inside of here is actually more of the chicken area. All right, day 30 for these black Australorps. Take a look at these guys. They're running in here with all my other birds. This is like the little chicken area back in the back. It's pretty funny. And look at how friendly they are. Take a look at this, super friendly. I can actually just pick them right up. Take a look at that, pretty awesome. Super friendly little chickens. They're getting some nice green, kind of a greenish black. It's kind of interesting how the, the colors in the black Australorps kind of change as they mature. They'll get like a really awesome greenish, kind of a sheen to them as far as a greenish black. Pretty awesome.